Welcome to this Wednesday webinar session on copyright. There's lots of different elements that make up copyright. Unfortunately, we can't cover everything in the one session. So I'm going to concentrate on some of the gray areas. Most of copyright, as people will know, is open to interpretation. So there's few black and white elements, which makes it really hard to give a definitive answer to questions, which is, of course, what our users tend to want. The answer we usually give is it depends, which can make it really frustrating, especially if you're trying to give concrete advice. Hopefully this webinar will make you feel more confident in how copyright works, gives you some answers, and maybe even prove that you know more than you think. Before we start, I need to say that this webinar is not legal advice, and if that is what you need, you should talk to your local legal team. I should also say that this webinar looks at UK copyright law specifically and that regulations might differ between countries. So if you're seeing this outside of the UK, you might need to check locally. So these are the topics we're going to cover today. A short recap of the basics of copyright and then a look at some of the key concepts, the kind of grey areas that drive us mad. We'll then look at a few tips for managing copyright and I'll point you in the direction of further help. When dealing with copyright, I think it's always good to refresh our knowledge of the basics, to introduce those who don't know, and also reassure those who do that they know their stuff after all, just so we're all starting on the same page. So copyright is an automatic legal protection, which begins when a work meeting the criteria on the left hand of the screen is created. So the work needs to be something original. And this is harder than it sounds, I think, because there's, there's a finite pool of ideas out there and chances are that someone has thought of something similar in the past, but the creator will need to prove that their work is sufficiently original. It also needs to be produced in a fixed form. So one of the common confusions around copyright is that it doesn't protect ideas. The idea does need to be turned into something concrete. So, for example, being written down, being drawn or otherwise expressed in some way. The work also needs to be in one of the seven forms you see on the right hand side of the screen. So it needs to be literary, dramatic, musical, artistic, a film, a broadcast work or a sound recording. It's worth reiterating, I think, at this point that you don't have to register something for it to be protected by copyright. That's another common confusion. A lot of people think you need to go through some kind of formal legal process to uh, ensure that your work is copyrighted. but it's automatic as soon as something original is produced in that tangible form. So copyright gives the holder of the copyright certain rights over that work. So for example, the right to make copies of it, perform it or share it with others online. So it's a really important thing to get right. A creator's rights under copyright are divided into two main areas, the economic rights and the moral rights. So economic rights are the rights to make money out of the work. So Creators can sell these or give them away, and that's usually done um, when we're talking about scholarly communication by signing a publication agreement with a publisher. These are the rights that the publisher will then exert over that material when it comes to things like copying and reprinting. In contrast to this, moral rights are always kept by the author, by the creator of the work. These are things like the right to be identified as the creator and the right not to be misquoted or subjected to any derogatory treatment. Even if the author signs away the right to make money from their work, they still keep these moral rights, which again is something that confuses people. Working in libraries, copyright is something that we see in a lot of things we do on a daily basis. So whether we're dealing with photocopying, uploading things to the BLE or publishing agreements, things like that. So it's obviously an important thing that we need to know about for our roles. But what about copyright in general? Lots of people have this impression of copyright that it was designed as a way to stop people doing what they want to do. It's a really negative thing. But really, it's the opposite. It should be seen as a positive thing. Copyright is a big part of the knowledge creation cycle, and it allows people to create new things, and at the same time protecting people's rights that have created other things. So in that way, it kind of offers this system of reward and recognition. So creators get credit for their work, while still letting other people build on the existing knowledge to create new knowledge. So rather than see it as a completely negative thing that's stopping us doing what we want, we should see it as more of a positive. So copyright is part of a bundle of rights, which are known as intellectual property rights, and these control how things can be used. So they cover the areas you see on the screen, things like copyright, design rights, patents, all sorts of things like that. 
Most institutions will have a local IP policy, which outlines how work is produced by staff and students can then be used for other reasons. So you can get a bit Cambridge specific for a minute. Cambridge has one, but it's quite different to most other universities. Usually the, the default when you create something as part of your job is that it belongs to your employer or your university. So for example, this webinar, which I've developed as part of my job under that system would belong to the University of Cambridge. However, Cambridge is actually different. So staff and students retain the copyright in their work. There are some exceptions. So if your work has been sponsored by a commercial company, or if you're producing what's known as work for university administrative purposes, so things like exam papers and library catalogues. Again, those are different rules. But the general rule is that at Cambridge, we control what happens to our intellectual outputs. So this is good news for students at Cambridge, and it's a really big draw as to why people choose to come here. But it also means that they have an increased level of responsibility, which means that we as their librarians also have that increased level of responsibility. Students need to understand intellectual property, their rights, and how they should go about protecting them. And I think this is where librarians can really help. And is another reason why we really need to work to understand copyright. So that's all great, but as easier said than done, I can appreciate. So copyright can be complicated, but hopefully I can start to break it down for you so you can feel more confident dealing with queries. It's important to know how actual copyright law works. And what copyright law is known as something called primary legislation, which means it's the law of the country that's been passed by the government. In the UK, we have the Copyright Designs and Patents Act, which was originally passed in 1988, but most recently updated in 2014. This is a really high level law and it's really general because it's got to cover lots of circumstances, so it can't go into too much detail. Because it can be so vague, it can also be quite confusing. Unless there's been a really similar case, which establishes what's known as a precedent, then you have to take the law and rely on your judgment interpretations and any copyright exceptions. And that's when people start to get panicked because it's, there's no one thing that tells you, you can do this, you can't do this, unless there has been that precedent set in most of the cases. So a lot of it is up to judgment and that is what lawyers are doing as well. They're just doing it with a legal education. So a good example of how confusing copyright is, is the monkey that you see on the screen, the case of the copyright monkey, which is something that uh, some of you might have come across before. This is Naruto, the copyright monkey. And in 2011, a wildlife photographer called David Slater set up some cameras in Indonesia to capture the local wildlife, just sort of left them running and left them ready to go. The monkey on the screen actually got hold of the automatic trigger and was just playing around with the camera and accidentally took the selfie that you see on the screen. This was, was obviously quite funny, so the story made the news and papers all around the world and it became known as the monkey selfie. What a lot of people don't know is it actually caused a big uh, copyright commotion because Wikimedia Commons took the photos and published them online because they considered that they were in the public domain because copyright law only, unsurprisingly, applies to humans. It doesn't apply to animals. This then started a bit of a debate because the photographer complained that he actually owned the copyright in the image and he asked Wikimedia to take them down because it was infringing on his, um, his economic rights because he wanted to make some money out of this picture because that was his job. Images were briefly taken down, but then Wikimedia ruled that because they weren't taken by a human, they weren't subject to copyright and they put them back up. And so on and on this went. And the argument actually ended up going to court with the photographer claiming that because he set everything up with the camera and the shot, he put it together. All the monkey did was click the button that the photographer owned the copyright. Things got even more complicated when Peter, which is the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, actually filed a lawsuit on behalf of the monkey, which they can do, claiming that he owned the copyright. And this sort of led more to an argument on whether animals can own copyright in an image, whether they're the photographer, whether the law applies to humans. It blew up and turned into a massive debate. So at the time of recording, the case was settled out of court and the photographer actually agreed to donate part of his profits from the image to various animal charities as a kind of gesture. It might seem a bit silly, this story, and it's actually a little bit sad because the photographer 
has actually lost quite a lot of money through doing this and it is his day job. But it does illustrate that copyright, even when you think it should be simple, because copyright law does not apply to um, animals, it still ended up in court, it still ended up with an argument. So nothing is ever as simple as it should be. The good news is that apparently this is all being made into a movie, so that will further complicate everything, but at least you can say you've seen a movie about copyright. I thought it might be helpful to take a step back and look at some of the basic copyright concepts, as I know that these are areas that most people get confused about. So hopefully having a clear idea about these will mean you feel more confident answering people's questions. Just to reiterate that everything that follows is based on UK copyright law only. When looking at copyright, you need to remember that it's the law of the country of publication which applies, not the law of the country you're using the work in, which in itself causes confusion. So although creators retain their moral rights over work, their economic rights, their rights to make money, can expire and works then enter what's known as the public domain. The length of time this takes is known as the copyright term and it varies across the globe. In many countries, it's the life of the author plus 70 years. And that's certainly the case in Australia, the US and the UK, which are three of the biggest um, producers of content. However, in other places it's different. So in Hong Kong, it's life plus 50 years for literary works. In India, it's life plus 60 years. And in Jamaica, it's life plus 95 years. No matter what point in the year the creator dies, the copyright expires on December the 31st of the year it's due to expire. So even if they died in April, the copyright doesn't expire until the December. And that's only if everything is straightforward. So to complicate things, different formats often have different copyright expiry dates within the same country. So the list on the screen there shows you the expiry dates for different formats under current UK copyright law. So you can see that even these aren't consistent. Another complication is that any one item has different layers of copyright. So it's a bit like an onion as you peel away the layers. Each of these layers comes with their own copyright restrictions, including their own expiry dates. And it kind of makes more sense if we illustrate this with an example. So if you think of a book that's made up of text, illustrations, cover art and typography, so the layout of the text and images within the actual book. Each of these elements has its own copyright with its own expiration date. And if we're dealing with a compilation, so where different authors have authored different chapters in a book, each of those will have its own expiry date. And in the UK, this will expire 70 years after the date of the author. So the compilation may have one um, expiry date, but each individual element has another. The best approach I found in dealing with this is to find out the expiry dates and then look at the local law and then go from there and just kind of build a picture of when the copyright expires. You can't just rely on its 70 years from this date. Another area which causes confusion is the difference between copyright licenses and copyright exceptions and what these can each be used for. So licenses and exceptions are two different things, but they are designed to work together. Copyright licenses apply to specific types of material or specific collections, and they're often purchased by an institution to give them the ability to do what they need to do with the material. So some examples of the most common educational licenses are on the screen, and these include things like the CLA license at the top there, the Copyright Licensing Agency license, which is what most people will have come across. This covers books and journals and is commonly used to make copies of material for VLEs and other online uses. There are also specific licenses covering television programmes, images and newspapers. Each has its own conditions and these are carefully monitored and many people are probably involved in the CLA reporting process at the moment. We could spend a whole session just talking about licenses, but unfortunately we don't have the time. The crucial thing to be aware of with these licenses is to be aware of which ones we have access to and what they cover. The biggest area of confusion around these is the difference between licenses and exceptions and how they fit together. If the use of something is covered by a license, 
then you're done. You don't need to look any further. It's covered. People get confused looking at all the different licenses and then trying to marry these with the exceptions, but you don't need to. If what you want to do is covered by a license, then you're good to go. So it's really important to know which licenses you have access to, what these cover and how these work. So what about if you do have to move on to the next stage and look at copyright exceptions? What exactly are they? Essentially, the certain actions which would normally be illegal under copyright law, but because they're for educational uses, they're allowed under a specific exception. And you can see these exceptions summarized on the screen next to the specific section number of the Copyright Act, which actually refers to the exception. All very confusing. Each exception is really clear about what it allows and what it doesn't, so it's important to remember that what you see on the screen is just a really brief summary. It's also important at this point to clear up another grey area that people get confused by, and that's what counts as educational use. So I've had many students and academics argue that because they want to do something for kind of good, noble reasons to promote knowledge, then that's educational and that falls under an educational exception. Unfortunately, that's not true. For these exceptions to count, they have to be part of a defined course of study and sometimes with a defined cohort of students. So this is why we have problems with lecturers sort of sharing their slides with copyright material online, because what's allowed in the classroom for a set group of students is not the same as what you can share on the web, even if the ultimate goal is to educate people. I can really understand why people get confused by this. But one reason it's important that librarians really understand what these exceptions are and how they can be used is because there's this kind of innate conflict. People think because they're releasing it for good reasons and educational reasons, they can rely on educational exceptions. But sadly, not true. However, it's not all bad news. There was a review of copyright law in 2014, which was known as the Hargreaves Review. And this clarified a lot of things and also looked at some of the newer educational uses of material, so things like text and data mining and parody which weren't included before. There was also a clarification on what to do if a contract with a publisher attempted to actually get round any of the exceptions, attempted to undermine them. There will probably be further changes as people start to get copyright legislation more up to speed with modern technology, but at least it's a start. The argument, the kind of exception most people will have come across is known as fair dealing and it's actually not an exception at all. In the US this is known as fair use but that means something slightly different so it's important not to get the terms mixed up. In the UK we have the principle of fair dealing which allows the select use of copyright materials as long as it's what it says on the screen what a fair and reasonable person would do. So essentially, you need to avoid infringing the economic rights of the copyright holder, which is their right to make money out of the work. I can appreciate it's a really woolly definition, which doesn't actually help, as it's really open to interpretation. And it's actually not something we should rely on when dealing with copyright, as it's more of a legal defence than an exception. And if you're having to rely on a legal defence, something somewhere has gone really wrong. So the Hargreaves Review extended fair dealing to all types of copyright work and this means that people are allowed to make limited copies for the reasons you see on the screen. The ones which are most applicable to education are kind of highlighted there. But we need to remember that these are all really specific purposes and in the UK fair dealing doesn't apply to other circumstances. Something most people will need to explain to their users is that there's again between edu difference between educational use and other use. So you're allowed to make limited copies for non-commercial research and private study. So for example, photocopying a chapter of a book that you want to read. You can rely on fair dealing for things like academic assignments, teaching to a defined audience and printed theses, but sharing work more widely, like publishing it online, actually falls outside the scope of fair dealing as it infringes on the economic rights of the copyright holder. If you're taking your work, their work and publishing it online as part of yours, then why is anyone going to actually pay to see the original? One area this is a particular problem is um, theses, which we'll talk about more in the next section of the webinar. 
so just to reiterate again fair dealing you need to think about what the, the purpose of the work is if it's one of the purposes on the screen so you can use it for academic assignments teaching purposes things like that but if you're um, taking work uploading it to a VLE or publishing anything online then you can't rely on fair dealing as a defence. We know that all of this is really confusing so we've made you a handy resource for people to print and take away and read online as part of our series of research port handy guides so you can view these online you can print them out for yourself or to give to your users and the link is there on the screen and hopefully it explains what fair dealing is and what you are and are not allowed to do in a really simple and accessible way. The principle of fair dealing comes up a lot when we're dealing with something known as third party copyright. And these are works that belong where the copyright actually belongs to someone else. You can see some examples of material like this on the screen now and it includes some common things that students are likely to be using like maps, figures, long extracts of text. Increasingly, authors are using open licenses like Creative Commons licenses to indicate how they're happy for others to use their work. But for a lot of material, researchers will need to assume that someone somewhere owns the copyright. If they want to use this in their work, then they need to think carefully about whether their use falls under an exception or whether they're going to need to seek permission. Those working on academic assignments can probably rely on the education exceptions, but if they're looking to publish, then it's different. They also need to be aware of the issue of self-plagiarism. Although this isn't a grey area, it's one that confuses a lot of people and I really understand why. So if someone has authored something and had it published, it's likely they've signed over their copyright to the publisher by signing a copyright transfer agreement or a publication agreement. This means that even though they wrote the original work, they'll have to treat it like any other material and cite themselves and get permission if needed to use it in further work which really confuses people but that is the way it is. One of the main reasons we talk about third party copyright and self plagiarism so much is that the management of copyright is big impact on PhD students when they're working on their thesis so PhDs at Cambridge now have to deposit an electronic copy of their thesis where before it was all paper based and that's a really significant change in terms of copyright because putting a thesis online in the repository actually counts as publication and suddenly educational exceptions and fair dealing no longer apply so what they had relied on they can't rely on anymore if students haven't properly looked at their use of copyright material this can cause really big problems for them and this again could be a whole webinar on its own but if you want more information on theses and copyright in general, then I'd recommend you have a look at the OSC web pages as there's a really comprehensive guide on there that takes you through step by step. If you want to use third party materials in any work that falls outside a license, education exceptions or fair dealing, then you'll need to seek permission. This is usually a fairly straightforward process once you know the steps that you should follow. So firstly, you need to find out who the copyright holder is. This is usually either the author or the publisher. And for published works, it should actually be really easy to find somewhere on the work. Just look for the little copyright symbol and then there should be the details of the copyright holder after that. If you aren't sure who to approach, then the publisher is usually a good place to start because if it's not them, they can usually tell you who it is. When it comes to seeking permission, it's best to start doing this early, as soon as you know you want to use something, basically. It can take a while for this permission to come through, and it's better to, to have the permission for something you don't end up using than scrabbling around at the last minute trying to get permission for something that's vitally important. All permission does need to be given in writing. Just having verbal permission to say so from someone is not enough. You should keep records of your search, even if it's unsuccessful, as you might need to rely on these records further down the line. It's important that you explain exactly what you want to use, why you want to use it and how it's going to be used. So this is called informed open consent. And it's so you can prove that people knew exactly what they were agreeing to when they agreed to it. So a creator might be fine with you using their work for an academic assignment. 
that only a few people are going to see. But if you publish that online anywhere, then that is a different thing and they might not be happy with that. So you need to explain exactly what you're going to do. And that's true of theses as well. So you need to say, I'm going to use this in my thesis. And I'm also that thesis is going to appear online in the Cambridge repository, just so they know what they're agreeing to. If you don't get an answer straight away, you can keep trying and asking for permission. But my advice would be not to try too hard. I would say give it about six weeks. Try again, and then if you hear nothing, assume that the answers are no. Students often uh, think that not hearing back means there's no objection, they can do what they want, but if you don't get permission, then you can't use things. That bit of copyright is crystal clear, so no answer does not mean permission is granted. Unfortunately, you have to move on and look elsewhere. It's also worth remembering that getting permission to use something will definitely cost time, but it might also cost money, which is something that students might need to factor in to any decision making, think about what they're prepared to pay. So now that you're more familiar with the basics, how do you actually go about managing copyright? Things will, of course, be different in each library, but there are some basic principles that you can follow. Having a knowledge of the different licenses and exceptions is really helpful here, so it might be a good idea to go back over the relevant sections of this webinar or do some extra reading just to make sure that you really understand. The best piece of advice I've ever had about dealing with copyright is to think of it as risk management. So unless you have a license to do what you want with material, there's always going to be a little bit of a grey area and some type of interpretation about using copyrighted material. If you think about what the risk is to doing something, then this will give you an idea of whether you should be doing it or not. It's kind of like a balancing act, and you need to assess whether you can accept the potential consequences if what you want to do went wrong. You should always look for the copyright holder and try and get permission, but if you can't, think about what the consequences would be. So what impact would this have on you personally as the user? on your library and on the wider university and is this a risk that you are prepared to take. Our role as library staff is not to act as a police force over copyright but really to equip our users with as much knowledge as we can so that they can go out and manage things themselves. I thought I would leave you with a few resources that I found useful when dealing with copyright and certainly when I get awkward questions. So I promise I'm not being paid to plug these books, but I found both of them really helpful for a lot of the questions I get about copyright. The Cornish book on the left is basically a long list of questions about different copyright circumstances with answers. So it's really good if you've got a quick reference question that you need to look up. The second Morrison book, the purple one on the right, goes into more detail about the online learning side of things and is good if you really want to understand the reasons behind things. There are also a few websites that I'd recommend if you have specific questions. So Create looks at the digital side of copyright and they maintain a really useful blog which discusses various issues and questions as they come up. You've also got Copyright User which offers answers to a lot of the most common questions. And it's the one on the left hand side there. They've got these kind of animated videos that they use to illustrate their point and they're really good for different levels of audience as well. So it's kind of a, a more fun way of getting things across. And then you've also got UK Copyright Literacy, and that's focused on educating library staff and academics about how copyright works and also includes some really useful ideas for educational games and things to make copyright education fun. So if you have questions, I'd really recommend bookmarking those websites. There's also some more local help available for Cambridge people. So on the right hand side there, the Cambridge University Libraries Copyright Group is made up of copyright experts from across libraries and the wider university. And they have an email help desk, which you see there on the screen, where you can forge your copyright queries and they'll be triaged out and answered by the most appropriate person to deal with that query. On the left hand side of the screen there, you also see we've just launched the new um, LibGuide, which looks at copyright issues specifically for the research community. So things like theses, publishing, sharing content, that kind of thing. This is hopefully the first of a set of copyright guides for different audiences. So one for researchers, one for academics, one for students, 
and for librarians, whoever it might be. So keep an eye on LibGuides as they develop. And of course, for non-Cambridge people, LibGuides are available to anyone with access to the internet. So that's a lot of information to cover in one webinar, and each section could easily have been its own session. But hopefully you feel a little bit better about copyright now, or at least a bit more equipped to deal with the, the kind of woolly, fluffy, grey area questions that we get. I just want to leave you with a final thought. I know that copyright can be confusing, and that we're wary about giving out what is essentially legal advice but it's actually far more dangerous for us in terms of liability to bury our heads in the sand and do nothing. So as long as we've demonstrated that we followed the guidance and best practice set down by the university, that we've demonstrated what they call due diligence and looked into things, got advice, done our searches for copyright holders and things like that, then that's all we really need to do. This is what we do as information professionals anyway every day, so hopefully now that you have that little bit of knowledge behind you about copyright, you can go on and answer queries with a bit more confidence. Thanks for watching.